Today I'll be enjoying a single malt scotch whiskey while talking new photos, TLRs, and taking viewer questions. Hello and welcome to another installment of Behind the Glass with a Glass. I'm Nick Carver and uh, we got a slew of things to cover today. Uh, but before we get into it, let me tell you about what I'm sipping here. So this is a scotch whiskey and I'll be honest, I've never been much of a scotch guy. Uh, more of a bourbon kind of guy. Uh, Tennessee whiskey, rye whiskey, you know the American stuff because what can I say? I bleed red, white, and blue. These colors don't run. Um, scotch never really tickled my fancy because uh, it's too smoky. Peaty, as they say, which we'll get to, but um, most scotches that I had tried were just uh, smokier than I liked. Now I admit, I think the, the signal of a refined scotch palate is the appreciation of that smokiness, but uh, I'm a novice, I'm a baby, I'm a rookie when it comes to scotch, so I generally don't like the smokiness. Now I originally thought that all scotch whiskeys were smoky. And um, turns out that's not the case. Because what I'm enjoying here is, uh, is not smoky. It doesn't have that peaty flavor. This is a Glen Morangi single malt scotch whiskey. This is the uh, 10 year uh, variety. And um, this, when I first tried it, um, was surprising to me because I never would have pegged it as scotch. Um, because again, every scotch I had tried had that smoky peaty flavor. And um, you know, I'm a novice, like I said, when it comes to scotch, but I've done some uh, reading up on how scotch is made, and I, I find it fascinating why it has that smoky flavor and why this doesn't. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about that. So if we go back to uh, scotch whiskeys, way back in the day, you know, before we had trains and uh, you know connected countries and all that kind of stuff and everything was very isolated. Uh, in Scotland to make whiskey uh, they needed a fuel source to malt the barley. The most readily available fuel source um, in the country at that time was peat. P-E-A-T not to be confused with P-E-T-E -E, who's a great guy but uh, P-E-A-T peat. And that essentially is, um, it's kind of the original fossil fuel. What it is, is uh, decomposing uh, vegetable material, so plants, um, moss, tree roots. They deteriorate in the bogs in Scotland, the marshlands, the wetlands. And um, it creates this uh, fuel source called peat, uh, which is made of all that decaying vegetative or veg vegetable material. And um, that was the most readily available fuel source. So that was used in the uh, malting process for the barley. So they would burn this peat and uh, the smoke coming off the peat would uh, infuse into the barley. And then the barley would be used in the whiskey making process. And then that flavor would transfer into uh, the whiskey itself. Um, they don't have to do it that way anymore. Peat is not the only available fuel source so it is completely possible to make a scotch whiskey without that peaty flavor but many scotches uh, like to carry on the tradition of uh, that peaty flavor that peatiness by including it even in modern day uh, distilling processes so for instance um, this Lagavulin right here which is another fantastic whiskey but you have to appreciate that smoky peaty flavor this is very peaty, very smoky. And this comes from the island of Isla, home to many uh, such distilleries that carry on that kind of peaty scotch tradition. Um, so the scotches I had tried were all that uh, island of Isla variety. You know, they were all the smoky peaty scotches. And it just never really, um, never really appealed to me. Uh, I think it's gonna appeal to me more as I try more whiskeys. Because again, I think it's kind of a sign of a refined palate is being able to appreciate that. But not all Scotch whiskeys use peat. Glen Morangi, for instance, is very low in peatiness. Uh, you really can't taste any smokiness. And um, 
The Glenmorangie Distillery is kind of interesting because they, they use the tallest stills in all of Scotland. They use these copper stills that are as tall as a giraffe, and um, they're actually formerly gin stills. So the Glenmorangie Distillery uh, acquired these uh, gin stills, which are exceptionally tall, and according to them, that contributes to the very soft and, um, well, drinkable flavor of uh, Glenmorangie whiskey. And then they're aged 10 years in ex-bourbon barrels. So this is aged in barrels that formerly held bourbon. So it's no wonder that this is a gateway scotch for me. Easy transition from this uh, American bourbon palate into some, uh, some scotch. Um, now, like I said, I'm, I'm drinking the 10 year here, which a 750 milliliter bottle will run you about $35 US dollars. Um, but Glen Morangi also has uh, an 18 year that I find quite delicious. Um, this is uh, much more expensive. It'll run you about 100 bucks for a 750 milliliter bottle. So it's over twice the price of the 10 year. I would say it's over twice as good. But um, this is no slouch, the 10 year, and it's very affordable. So if you uh, want to try a Scotch whiskey and perhaps you're not into that, um, that peatiness, give Glen Morangie 10 year a try because uh, it is quite nice. Another uh, bit of advice I would give you is if you're drinking Scotch, throw a little dash of water in there. Um, you know, I had heard people do that, and a younger me, a dumber me, thought, oh, you're watering down your booze. <laughs> okay, not for me and then I would try and drink it straight and it just wasn't having it. Throw a little bit of water in there. It actually brings out the flavors. It mellows it out just enough to be more enjoyable and you can really uh, let the flavors kind of um, take center stage in your mouth. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be sipping. Now let me tell you what we're gonna talk about uh, today, photography related. Uh, basically, uh, three things I wanna cover today. First and foremost, I got some new pictures to share with you because uh, I'm an egomaniac and I wanna shove the thing I made into your face. Look at the thing I made. So I'll be sharing some pictures with you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the camera I used to create these pictures. Uh, I also want to share with you this uh, really cool frame mock-up um, thing that a viewer uh, sent to me. And then finally, we'll, we'll finish it off with a little bit of Q&A. So I did a Q&A on the last behind the glass with the glass. We're going to continue that uh, a little bit. But let's start with the new photos. So. As you may know from my previous videos, uh, I spend time on occasion in the town of Buellton, Buellton, California. And Buellton is where Houston's liquor is. Um, I spend time up there uh, fairly frequently because uh, that's where my in-laws have a condo. Um, but it's where I did the Houston's liquor picture. Uh, it's a great town. I really love spending time up there. It's a much uh, calmer pace of life than we have here in Orange County. Um, Houston's liquor, by the way, is a fantastic liquor store. Last time I was up there, I actually went in um, looking for a very hard to find bourbon. But I went into Houston's Liquor um, to see if they had it, kind of as a goof. So like I walked in, I asked the guy behind the counter, jokingly, hey, do you have, uh, you have such and such? <laughs> I bet you don't. <laughs> and he's like, uh, yeah, we got two here, we got one over there. Uh, and I was like, whoa, hey, what? And so I picked one up, um, even though I already had a bottle, because I don't know when I'm gonna find another one. Um, so, uh, really great liquor store. Also, they fixed the sign. It's no longer Tons IQ. It says Houston's Liquor. So, uh, good for them, but, um, even better for me that I got a picture of it before they fixed the sign, because I prefer it, you know, with the sign broken. Anyway, I digress. The new pictures. So, uh, last time I was up in Buellton, we were getting a lot of fog, um, which, I mean, shooting in fog. Is there anything better? Love shooting in fog. Uh, I brought my Mamiya C220. Um, and uh, shot Kodak Portra 400, pushed a stop, and um, just went around and shot handheld. I uh, didn't really have anything in, uh, in mind ahead of time of what I was going to shoot. I basically showed up, drove around, and tried to look for something to photograph. Um, first thing I found was a, uh, a, a parking lot that had uh, a bunch of these RVs that um, I guess they're going to be fixing them up and selling them or something because they're all very similar model and they were evidently storing them for some future purpose. But I photographed those because um, I thought they were pretty cool looking, uh, cool looking RVs. Um, but then the, uh, the next thing I found, which is even more interesting to me, is there was this uh, just delightful little uh, trailer park. Um, 
prefab home, I guess, is the politically correct um, uh, nomenclature. It's not really a trailer park. They're not like trailers you can hook up and just drive away. Um, mobile home park. Evidently uh, an older crowd, you know, kind of a retiree community. And um, I just found it so lovely. I mean, at the risk of sounding, you know, not the most masculine guy in the world. It was adorable. It was cute. It was just a great little neighborhood. So I walked around, um, shot with my TLR, just looking for scenes that looked interesting in the fog. Um, I, I think growing up in a very suburban, cookie cutter, tract housing kind of place like I did, um, I, my, I tend to be hyper aware of like um, kind of uh, cookie cutter neighborhoods like this. So I mean, th these are all essentially the same mobile home, just repeated again and again. And I used to hate that, but I kind of like it now. I like photographing that. It's interesting to me. Um, but lots of cool cars around there, really nice layers, and just um, had that kind of very Americana um, neighborhood feel to me. And it was very quiet, and it was uh, and quite enjoyable just uh, walking around taking pictures. Um, so those were a lot of fun. Uh, I also uh, found this farm off the side of the road where there were some crops going off into the fog with a really run down farmhouse off to the side. So I got a couple shots there too that I liked. Um, and then finally, you know, a lot of the roads up there uh, have uh, oak trees going along the side and I think they're protected so they can't just like cut them down for power lines. So they end up cutting away the trees to make way for traffic and for the power lines. And I found those, I thought they looked really interesting in the fog because they're these shapes, almost like cloud watching. You can watch these trees and they almost look like different things to you. Like, ooh, that tree kind of looks like a duck or this one looks like whatever. Um, but I also just like that, um, you know, anything that kind of shows humanity trying to rein in nature. Uh, and they do it, we do it in such funny ways sometimes. Like the fact that we just like cut a curve out of the tree and cut a, a box out of the tree to let the cars go under. I don't know. I find it kind of interesting. Um, so I enjoyed those pictures. I had a lot of fun shooting them. You know, there's no uh, Pulitzer Prize winners in there, but a lot of fun little ditties, uh, good little additions to the uh, the larger portfolio. And uh, like I said, I used my Mamiya C220 to shoot it. And you know, the more I use this camera, the more I love using this camera. You know, there's something special about shooting square format, and there's something special about shooting uh, a TLR. And this has both, baby. As the, uh, the viewer who gave me this camera told me, he said it's kind of like a, uh, it's almost like a handheld large format camera. So basically what he meant by that is like the process, all the, the controls, it's very much like a large format camera. Um, the shutter speed and the aperture are controlled on the lens, like on large format lenses. You have to cock the shutter separately for each picture and uh, trigger it with a different uh, button each time. You have to manually wind it, like it's all very, you know, step by step, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, um, which is a lot like large format, and it really doesn't do anything for you, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, I have the 105 millimeter lens on here, and I haven't really had a desire to get any different lens. It's just the right focal length for me, I think. My only complaint about this camera is that um, if the shutter is cocked, and you go to take the picture on the shutter release, but, but you kind of you abort the mission before you click it. You know, you back off. You say, yep, yeah, never mind, never mind. But you you didn't click it all the way, but you just barely touch the shutter. It like resets the um, the cocking mechanism or, or the winding mechanism or something to where that you can't click. It it's noted in the manual, so they they know about this, and it's just the design, and it just gives you a simple solution to work around. You switch to multi-exposure, and then you can take the picture, and then you switch it back to single exposure, and then you can advance. Uh, it's a simple thing, but I'm still getting used to that because I am the king of aborting photos. As I'm halfway down on the shutter, I'll be like, yeah, that's perfect, and I'm clicking halfway, and I'm like, no, 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 no. And then I move, you know, a centimeter that way, and then I want to do it again. Um, so I'm the king of doing that. I got to make sure that on this particular camera, I don't click uh, the shutter at all until I'm ready to actually fully depress it because um, it can cause problems. Like for instance, on this trip, um, I ran into that exact issue. So I switched it to multi so I could get around that whole problem. I took the picture and then I forgot to wind the film and I forgot to take it off multi. So uh, I ended up getting an accidental double exposure, which um, I mean, looks kind of cool, I guess, but 
I really would have loved to see these two pictures separate. So um, minus that one little quirk, um, which is just a, a training part on my, my end, um, this camera is so fun to use. One thing I really love about TLRs, by the way, is that if you have the right length strap, you can just have it taut around your neck and it puts it at just the right position. And that gives a lot of stability, so you can kind of um, get away with slightly slower shutter speeds, I think, because that strap is putting tension on it and you're putting it at just the right angle that it's giving you a whole lot of uh, stability in the camera. So a uh, really great camera, the C220. Um, it's a lot of fun to use, and especially shooting black and white. You know, I've shot some black and whites on this, um, and uh, square format, TLR, black and white. Man, is there anything better? I don't think so, except maybe this whiskey. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so there's my pretty pictures. Item number two. Um, I had a viewer send me an email um, with a really nice gift. Um, he makes these mock-ups of uh, framed artwork that are Photoshop documents and you can just drop your your image in and then it looks like a, uh, a rendering of your artwork. Um, it's really cool. He has a bunch of different varieties with matte, without matte, float frame, all this kind of stuff. Um, but he sent me one just as a thank you for my videos. Uh, he's also a contributor so he's, he's double gifting me. Um, but he sent me like a 6x17 mock-up where I can just drop in one of my images and I can, I, it has all these options. I got a white frame, I got a black frame, uh, I got it against a white wall, against a dark wall, um, tons of options. And then I was so uh, ecstatic about this, it was so fun to drop my pictures in and see what it looks like framed, that uh, I started making all these requests to him. Hey, can you do a, a medium brown frame and a, and a dark... Um, dark brown wood frame, and can you put a gray frame in there too? Oh, can we also do a, a thinner frame, and then can we do a 4x5 and a 5x4, and then he even threw in a, a, a square triptych set. This guy, Bogdan, a real mensch, and uh, he obviously watches my channel and he knows that I like doing square triptychs because he threw that one in um, without me even asking. But I have all these ways to mock up my artwork now, so that if I have a client coming to me asking, you know, hey, I might want to get this framed, I can throw up a mock-up for them and uh, they'll get a, a good look at it. So really cool product. He never asked for me to talk about it, but I wanted to tell you guys about it because I know a lot of photographers watch this channel and it might be useful for you. So um, check out supertall.media, uh, supertall.media. And um, he's got a bunch available for purchase and download right away, but you can get a custom one. Um, like as you guys probably know, if you watch my channel, I do a lot of float frame stuff. So he sent me float frame stuff. and. Man, it's just really cool. Uh, it makes me want to print more also. It makes me want to make another uh, framed framed piece. But um, I'm out of wall space, baby. I don't know where I'd even put that. Um, so just a couple things there. Uh, but let's talk, let's do the some Q&A. So we'll just chip away at a few questions here. We're not going to get, get super long-winded about it. Um, all right. So uh, these are all questions that were submitted on my Instagram quite a while back. And I'm just slowly, uh, slowly chipping away at them. Um, so, first off, uh, this comes from Corentin.strhs. Uh, and this person asks, any plans for traditional 4x5 video shoots? Um, yes, very much so. Uh, I know it's been a little while since I've posted a video. Um, there's many reasons for that, uh, but I, I plan on getting back into shoot, shooting some on-location videos very soon. And uh, two of them that I have in mind right now will involve 4x5. Uh, so one is a local thing um, that I'll be doing as one of my on-location videos and 4x5 and I think 6x17 will also be involved in that. So um, just waiting for the right weather conditions and for all the uh, smoky air in California to clear out a bit because uh, it's causing issues for the lighting. Um, and then also I'm going to be doing a video with another channel. Uh, kind of a collaboration video. They're going to be filming it and posting it, and I'll be sure to let you guys know about that. But that's actually going to be on 4x5. Um, so I haven't given up large format. Still very much love it. Just haven't had a chance to use it much uh, much lately. All right. Next question comes from Martin Vickney. At what point did you say to yourself, this is my style, this is what I'm going to be shooting? Um... So that question jumped out at me because it's real interesting, um, this whole idea of style and um, choosing your style. 
Um, I get the distinct feeling that other people have a much clearer idea of what my style is than I do. So I constantly feel like I'm figuring out my style and I, I'm all over the map and, and I haven't really found my voice yet. I still feel that way all the time. I don't feel like I have a style. But I've had several viewers and uh, Instagram followers and stuff say things that indicate to me they seem to have a pretty strong idea of what my style is. You know, they'll, they'll say things like, oh, this is, um, this is inspired by Nick Carver or this is such a Nick Carver photo or whatever. And um, I, I'm always super interested in that because they're evidently picking up on something that I don't feel is fu fully formed myself. And um, the more I've thought about that, the more I think that's okay. Um, it's okay that I don't think my style is fully formed uh, and that I'm still looking for it and grasping it. Because, you know, many, many years ago when I was doing super high saturation landscape -y type stuff, I knew my style, man. I could describe it. Uh, I knew exactly what, what niche I was trying to fit in. Um, and my style was very clearly defined in my own head. And I was creating some of the most unoriginal, boring work I ever have in my entire photography career, in my opinion. But now, I feel like I don't have a clear idea of my style. My style is all over the place. It's, it's, it's a mess. It's all over the map. I don't know what I'm doing exactly. I'm trying. I'm, I'm pursuing something, but I don't feel like I'm, I'm really establishing a unique style for myself. And uh, I feel like I've made a lot of my best photos in that phase when I'm not chasing a, an established style. Um, so I, I think for me at least, if I'm able to pin down the style I'm pursuing, then I'm probably copying someone else. If I'm unable to pin down the style and I'm just purely taking pictures that I think are gonna be cool or that I'm gonna like, then I'm probably tapping into something that's truly coming from me. But as soon as I'm able to describe that style too well, maybe I'm just copying someone else. Maybe I'm just picturing another style that I saw and I'm not really tapping in to my own innate whatever it is I'm trying to communicate. So um, I never had a point where I said, this is my style and this is what I'm gonna be shooting, uh, at least in, in my later career. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's okay. Um, Almos Cause, uh, probably butchered that name, asks, have you ever felt like giving up photography? Absolutely. And uh, I won't go too deep into this because I've actually covered this in uh, a couple of podcast interviews um, I did. One was on um, uh, Analog Talk podcast. And the other one was on uh, F-Stop Collaborate and Listen. So if you want to find those um, podcasts with me being interviewed, I talk about it, but I'll give you kind of the quick rundown. Uh, so in 2012, I hit a really low point in my photography and I was ready to walk away from it completely. Um, I was actually looking, I, I was already working as a, as a photographer, but um, I was looking to close down my business and go get a job. So I was, I was looking for jobs at UPS. I was looking on their website, you know, career opportunities. I was thinking about, oh, maybe I could be an accountant or something. Like I was just, I was so done. I was completely over it. I didn't find any joy in photography anymore. I hated um, talking about it. I hated the community, if I'm completely honest, and I just didn't really like anything about it anymore. Um, and so I was ready to walk away from it completely. Um, but thank God, uh, I just one day was sitting in my parents' backyard trying to figure out why I don't like photography anymore. And it just hit me all of a sudden that um, I should start shooting film again. So this was the time when I was only shooting digital and I just randomly had the thought of, oh, I should pick up my film camera again. I haven't picked it up in six years or whatever. I should just try doing that. Maybe that will, you know, re-spark some, some interest. And like the moment I had that thought, I felt my whole body change. I felt my face change. I felt all the, this like muscle tension of like thinking and trying to figure this out just like melted away and relaxed. And I was like, that's it. That's what I gotta do. And then I immediately started thinking, oh, I can do large format and I can do medium format. I never tried those before. I was always 35 millimeter. And I like suddenly got, like, it's like that excitement 
that got me into photography in the first place was all being held behind a dam. And it was just me shooting digital was just making the dam. I was just concreting the dam and plastering it over and just pushing back all this excitement. And uh, because I completely abandoned film, the thing that got me into photography in the first place, um, all that excitement was just held behind this dam. And then like, as soon as I had that thought, oh, I should pick up my 35 millimeter and oh, I could do four by five and oh, I could do medium format and all this stuff. It's like the dam just exploded and all of that excitement just came back over me and it was, it was all 100% back. And uh, that was in 2012 and it hasn't waned since. So film saved me um, from giving up photography, tr uh, honestly and truly. So that's one of the reasons I'm still so passionate about film photography and getting other people into it is it really did uh, pull me out of a very dark place of I hate photography now. So um, that's how film photography got me out of it. But yes, I definitely felt like giving up photography at one point. All right. Any bad experiences with the public when out shooting on location that you can share? That comes from Matt Solomon, Matt Solomon Film. Um, this one isn't so much bad as just, it really pissed me off at the time. But um, so on my uh, client work, photographing uh, a retail center, um, I had kind of an annoying, annoying instance. Um, I got sent to photograph this new shopping center out in Moreno Valley. And Moreno Valley is a bit of a drive from me and it's also very hot. It's out kind of in the desert of, uh, of Southern California. And uh, it was a two day job, it was a huge center, it was very important and it needed to look really, really high end and really nice. The first day, it was 106 degrees I think. The second day it was 105 degrees. So it was blisteringly hot, it was fresh asphalt, like fresh tarmac, so it was just black radiating heat. The trees were all new and so young that they didn't even cast a shadow. So I, I, I couldn't get shade. Uh, I couldn't just hang out in one of the um, restaurants or anything because I had to be out shooting. And also that's kind of weird unless I'm there eating. So I was just like baking out there, taking pictures. And the every hour that passed, I just hated my life more and more and more. And I tell you, nothing will make you doubt where you went wrong in your life, like photographing a Taco Bell on a Friday night. Because it just doesn't feel that glamorous. It doesn't feel like you're a glamorous photographer when you've been roasting in 106 degree heat all day and now you're sent to photograph a Taco Bell. So I was not in the best of moods. But on, uh, I think it was day two, I was photographing a Sonic. So like a fast food joint that you find here in, uh, in the US. And uh, I was photographing the Sonic, and uh, I was photographing kind of the drive-through area. And um, this big uh, SUV, Suburban, Chevy Suburban, comes through the drive-through, and there's a little bit of commotion going on in the SUV. I can tell there's like some giddy people in there, and they're kind of the, the windows rolled down, they're looking at me and stuff and whatever. And it's it, mostly teenagers. I think there were like four teenagers, guys, in there, and I think their dad was driving or something like that. And they're getting a little giddy. I'm already irritated by that. Uh, just quick side note, when I'm out doing architectural photography, so many people will walk in and be like, hey, take a picture of me, <laughs> photo bomb. <laughs> and uh, if I'm not in a fantastic mood, I don't generally take that too well. It's very annoying because I'm obviously trying to work as if I'm gonna come down and come, come up to wherever they sell insurance and just lay on their desk and be like, <laughs> I'm laying on your papers, <laughs> look at me. So I don't like that in general when people are, are obviously trying to get a rise out of me when I'm clearly working. But this took it to another level because um, I'm down adjusting my camera or something like that and then I hear the commotion in their car get a little louder and some laughing and stuff and I look up and uh, the kid in the front seat has the window rolled down and his ass is sticking out the window with his pants pulled down. So he's mooning me, which is objectively hilarious. I know it's funny. That, of course, is hilarious. But I was in no freaking mood. So um, I yelled some expletives to him, um, dropped a few F-bombs, and then uh, angrily picked up my camera, moved on to another building. So timing, I think, was more the problem there because obviously that's funny. Teenagers mooning you? Classic. That's just good, clean fun. Classic. Um, but that was kind of an annoying situation. 
Uh, I've never really had people like give me a hard time or threaten me or any of that kind of stuff. You know, people are actually generally very nice when they see you taking pictures. Um, if anything, they'll just ask, you know, what are you taking pictures for? Just to kind of suss me out, see if I'm a little suspicious or not. But for the most part, it's actually, I haven't really had any issues um, except for getting mooned. Um, next question, what is your approach to writing text descriptions to go alongside your work? That comes from O.R. Jackson. Um, it's a good question. I gave up on that many years ago. So, uh, you know, coming up with descriptions or uh, coming up with, um, you know, interesting titles for the images uh, is evidently not my forte because I just, I, I would struggle so much with it and I always felt it was not contributing anything to the photo. Um, like, for instance, if you look at my pictures on my website or something like that, you, you'll see that the, the titles are pr pretty lame, pretty elementary. Desert Layers 1, Desert Layers 2. Like, I, I don't try and get creative with that because I, I've just given up on, on trying to get creative there. And uh, I've made peace with that. I think it's okay. Uh, I basically realized at some point, like, um, you know, if, if I was able to describe what I wanted the viewer to get from my photo, I would have just been a writer. Like, why take photos if um, I'm gonna just explain what the photo's about. So uh, that's why I'm not a writer. I take pictures because the pictures are able to capture something that I can't put into words because I'm not good enough with words. Um, excuse me, I'm not well enough with words. <laughs> I got myself. Um, so I'm just not good enough with words for the, for the descriptions to really contribute anything to the photo. Now, the only exception, of course, being is if I'm explaining some technical background to it um, to people that would be interested in that. So if I'm you know, sharing the picture with another photographer and I want to have a write-up on like what went into the whole thought process of it or what technically I did, what, you know, I did with the camera, anything like that, I'm all for that. But um, trying to like, I don't know, add any sort of description to a picture, I'm, it's just, just ain't me. I'm not, I'm not good enough um, with words. So um, that's the deal on text descriptions. Um, all right, let's do one more. As a photographer, What's your biggest insecurity? That comes from uh, Tylor Photo. Um, I think I'm pronouncing that right. As a photographer, what's your biggest insecurity? Uh, I would say, I don't know, every other photographer's work. Like, <laughs> uh, I'm very insecure about my work in general, um, and I'm insecure about my uh, abilities as a photographer. I'm convinced any day everyone's gonna figure out I'm a hack. I'm sure many people have already. Maybe that's why I don't have more subscribers. Um, but I, seeing other people's work that I admire makes me really insecure. Uh, and I, I start to feel like I'm doing everything wrong, my photos suck, I'm just copying everybody, uh, I'm not taking enough pictures, I'm not doing this right, whatever. If I look at other people's work, that tends to happen. Um, and I think it's an admiration thing. I, I think most people correctly turn that into motivation. So what they're actually feeling is motivated, but what I'm feeling is I should just give up and burn all my cameras because I'm not good, as good as that person. So, um, so for that reason, I actually don't look at photography very much. I've talked about this previously, but I don't look at photography very much because it, it really puts me in that, that insecure state. Um, I don't know that there's anything that's going to talk me out of that ever. I think it's just a, a part of my personality. You know, uh, I'll probably be 60 and have a much more respectable portfolio and still be like, oh, I, I don't have enough good pictures or I'm not good or I have no idea what I'm talking about and everyone else knows what I'm talking about more than me um, or whatever. So um, I'm generally very insecure uh, when it comes to my photography. So I try and uh, do things to limit that being uh, fueled, you know, adding any fuel to that fire. One of those is not really looking at other people's work too much, but also trying to just not take it too seriously. Uh, you know, f all this photography stuff, I, I just have to remind myself again and again, like, you know, you're not trying to change the world with your photographs. It's okay. You know, you can take photos that are just kind of okay, and that's fine, you know? That's part of the process is taking photos that are okay or photos that you're not proud of or photos that, um, you know, no one else finds that impressive. It's fine. 
It's part of the process. Not every photo Ansel Adam took was incredible, you know. Um, so that's the deal on uh, biggest insecurity. Um, kind of a sour note to go out on, but uh, I think that's it. Um, I don't want to keep you any longer. So I'm going to finish off this bit of Glenn Morangi and uh, relax a bit, but uh, I highly recommend it, especially if you're more into the bourbons and kind of the American whiskeys and you've never been a big fan of scotch. See if this is a, a gateway for you, because I think you'll like that it's, uh, it's not super peaty. And it's very, very, very drinkable. So, until next time. Thanks for watching. As always, you know I appreciate you. And uh, cheers. Thank you.